Hey, I'm Mike Squires, and this is the Couchers Podcast, episode whew, 92. Can you believe it? 92. Um, my guest in this episode is William Duvall, who is, I guess, most famously known as being the singer in Alice in Chains for the last 14 or so years, 15 years maybe, and... Uh, you know, I knew he had a pretty rich history. I saw him back in like 2001. We talked about it. Um, but man, I, there's I learned so much uh, through talking to him in this episode. So uh, and I'm super, super grateful uh, to let me just say thank you to Susan Silver for connecting us. And um, we first were connected uh, so that William could perform in a Couchless video, which I'm super <laughs> excited to release. It came out so great. The music, I haven't edited the video. Maybe the video will be a turd, but uh, William looks great at least. Um, you know, I, I reached out originally back when William released his solo record, One Alone, late last year, 2019. And we were not able to connect, but connected uh just whatever this this last week and you know i loved the single on that album it's called till the light guides me home you should go listen to it it is definitely a departure from stuff that he's done that you prop that you most likely know about but in this conversation i also learned so much other stuff i learned about this band no walls and i found some stuff on youtube and listened to it all day today it's so killer um so you know, I hope that you enjoy this episode. I really, really had a great time. Uh, William was was a super animated storyteller, and uh, it was a real pleasure to to hear his story. So, thank you, William. I appreciate it. I'm so looking forward to being able to share the song and the video with you, bud. So, let's see what else. Um, thank you. To everyone who's been supporting Cowtriffs, you guys are great. You guys are number one. I really appreciate it. You know, here's the thing. i gotten a lot of listens lately. So anyone that's listening, thank you so much. If you are enjoying the podcast or the videos, which I don't know if you caught the, um, the Fiona Apple cover, that I posted last week. If you haven't seen it, go seek it out. It's fucking killer. And I'm not patting myself on the back because it's not great by any fault of my own. Um, you know, I play the bass and everyone else does the heavy lifting. All I did is put the folks together and have the master Don Gun um, mix it for me. So uh, go check that out. Uh, and listen, if you if you enjoy the podcast or if you enjoy, are enjoying the videos and you want to be supportive, you can you can do it at Anchor.fm for as little as ninety nine cents a month, and it would go a long way. To I mean, all the money goes right back into equipment for this all this to happen. So um, I want to thank some folks that support the podcast every month for as little as ninety nine cents a month. I can say your name too. Now listen, thank you Ryan Waters, thank you Hayden Smith, thank you Jamie McParland, thank you Teresa Morgan, thank you Matt Gabs, thank you Justin Jones, thank you Deja Colon Tuono, thank you Adam Pranica, thank you Dan Hurst, thank you Joan Baker McKagan. I don't know if I say Baker or McKagan first, but thank you Joan, you're the best. Thank you Dan Leary, thank you Kathy Giordano, thank you Mike Lacerda, thank you Rebecca Pellman. Thank you, Daniel Bland. Thank you, Chris Smith. Thank you, Perry Morgan. Thank you, Oliver Spencer. Thank you, Paul Hutzler. Thank you, Justice Gash. Thank you to Rolla Amplifiers, who did connect me to Bob Balch, who does have a signature amp over there. That was last episode. It was great. Um, and uh, thank you to Steve Hall. And thank you to... Hmm, River City Guitars. Now, you guys have heard me talk about River City Guitars. River City Guitars is the little guitar store that could. Over there 
and Spo Compton, Spo Vegas, Spokane, Washington. Um, you know, my guy there, Bobby Kluss, he is out uh, hustling about the country, buying up guitars. If you have a guitar or a collection of guitars or a few guitars, if you've got guitars that you want to get rid of or you're considering getting rid of, um, you know, get a hold of River City Guitars. Uh, How do you get a hold of them? Well, let me tell you. You can go to RiverCityGuitars.com. You could call them at 509-818-7693 or you could email them at sales.rivercityguitars at gmail. Um, So uh, they're always buying. Every day is a good day to buy guitars over there at River City Guitars. Uh, Vintage, cool, used, whatever you have. Give them a shout. Now, every single week I pick a different instrument off their website and uh that's my pick of the week now uh this week it's a it's a 52 esquire relic now i if i said it once i've said it a million times if i could only have one guitar in the world for the rest of my life it would be a telecaster if you don't have one you're you're doing yourself a disservice and if you want a really killer one (laughs) Look no further. This one weighs barely over six pounds. You might as well just call this six pounds. Uh, six pounds. Ba- this thing weighs six pounds in a 40 bag. I'll bet, you know, they had these, what do they call, smuggler smuggler guitars they had? Because they had the, you know, if there's a route underneath this pick guard, you could take that thing off and, is, you know, you don't know. Maybe uh, there's something underneath there, and then it only weighs six pounds. You can pick this thing up. Mm-hmm. For $27.99 plus a little shipping. They're taking offers. Go get a look at it. It is real pretty. Uh, so thank you, River City Guitars. I love you guys. You're the best. And um, I guess, as always, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, remember the golden rule. Treat other people the way you would want them to treat you. That's a paraphrase. Um and uh, don't don't be a dick. It's really easy. It's not. It's like the easiest thing you'll do all day is not be a dick. Let's see. Whoops, that's not what I want to do. Do I speaker on? There speaker off. I'm gonna, what am I doing here? Speaker on. I don't want video on. <laughs> hey, I didn't want video on, but <laughs> it's not what I wanted. You better, hey, you better fix yourself up real quick, man. <laughs> not what I wanted. Are we recording? Are we not, we're not going out we're live, We're not recording. We? No, it's nothing like that. I just, uh, sometimes I'll have the video on. Um, yeah. Just so that it's a little more of a personal conversation, you know. It's, it's, That's cool. Yeah. Yep. We don't have but to. We're just recording. We're just rolling audio. Yeah, I just uh, I have the audio fed over to Logic. It's uh, right. Easy peasy. Okay. Yep. How you doing? You all right? Doing all right, man. Just had a had a garage door guy leave. Had to have a new garage door put on. So he he's just leaving right now. So I was getting down the wire. I was like, you know, we should probably settle up. I got to get on this call here. <laughs> it's good to have a garage though. <laughs> it's good to have a garage door guy. Yeah, and and uh, he he made a he made a. A house call last week on a on a Sunday to assess the problem. So uh, nice. anyway, we we finally got got it together. Had to get a new door. So we got the we got the reinforced steel working now. So we're good. Dang, is it uh, is it hot as hell down there right now? It's uh, yeah, it's hot during the day. It's humid right now. It's raining. So um, I don't know if you can. There's a skylight right there. You can see all the rain coming oh, through. Yeah. But uh, just started, yeah. But it's been raining off and on here uh, every day, summertime, summer rain. It started pouring here today. I'm in the city right now, in Brooklyn. Um, oh, you're. And uh, it's you know, I'm a West Coast guy. It doesn't get humid like this, man. It's like it's 93, and yeah. you know, 80 percent humidity. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, totally. I had to get. Um, a dehumidifier for my basement it's like it gets up to like 65 humidity down there and i got gear down there so i did yeah. the same thing what you gotta do 
Um, where did you record when you recorded for this unreleased video thing that we're gonna we're putting out? Where did you record that at? Was that at your house? That was actually at a at a friend's place. Um, I just decided to go over there. It was my, great. It had that. Uh, the, the big really, high wood roof there it's so good looking yeah it's an add-on that he did to his house and he just it's beautiful beautifully done beautifully done um goals that's with hashtag goals it's like yeah man that's what i'm talking about i'm trying yeah. to navigate the idea of building a little exterior building um, mm -hmm. on my you know we have like a half acre mm -hmm. not a ton of space but uh, mm -hmm. enough that you know we could build a little something, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm in a similar situation, just about the half acre, and 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 you know enough room for possibilities, and you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, finding, you know, it it just depends. Like, especially, I don't. I mean, I'm sure that if when people come over and they're like, "Well, what are you doing?" You're like, "Well, I'm gonna." I'm going to build a little studio. Like I, now I'm just like, I'm just building a garage. I don't tell people shit because mm. if, if I say, Oh, I'm, I'm from the city or I moved up here from the city. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, you, Oh, cause there's other, there's people more people who have had more successful careers than I have that live sprinkled all around the area where I'm at. Mm. And, uh, you know, contractors will come in and yeah. just be like, start, oh. they start, <laughs> yeah yeah city tax Listen, oh <laughs> you're doing what oh yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> so uh, yeah yeah exactly you uh <laughs> someone comes over and this oh re oh you're in a band well, uh what band do you need to say uh <laughs> in nothing <laughs> nothing you wouldn't Our time i just my spirit i just do it for fun yeah my hobbyist yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's your day to day like right now, man? Uh, you know, I I stay busy enough. There's yeah. no, there's no, I mean, uh, it's obviously different than a little bit than than it would have been. Um, I would have been coming off of European tour by now and probably moving into some U.S. dates and, you know, <clears throat> my summer <clears throat> was uh. Six months ago, my summer was still slated for, you know, traveling, you know, yeah. but uh, now it's just kind of like, you know, keeping uh, keeping busy more on the home front, you know, uh, doing some things around the house and that sort of thing. Contracting the garage. Right, exactly. <laughs> this kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, the. Uh, that single that you put out mm -hmm. i did I, I guess i'm never surprised by anything i'm very i'm very rarely surprised by anything anymore but i didn't really see that coming as such a uh such a departure and as really great oh thanks man um i uh i just want to i want to hear more of it i want to hear more and more and more of that oh man yeah well there's an album <laughs> yeah 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 no, no i'm well aware of that um, are you, are you taking advantage of the downtime to, to write more as well? Yeah, I am. And, uh, I had already, uh, kind of started thinking ahead to, uh, what, what might happen next, um, as far as, uh, putting out my own music, you know, under my own name and, and, uh, I could see. I could see several possibilities, but one of them has always been getting back into electric music, um, you know, and uh, that's kind of where I'm leaning toward right now. This is in terms of like what I envision, but um, but yeah, it, it, what, what I love about having put out the One Alone album is that once you do something like that, if it does fly, it gets you into a whole other territory in terms of the kind of gigs you can play and 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 uh the, the you know just even the audience that you can attract you know uh, there's a lot of people who um you know wouldn't wouldn't normally be interested in in, in virtually any of the things i've done 
who would love <laughs> this, who do love this album. Right. You know? So uh, it's it's attracted new people. It's it's kept uh, quite a few of the old, uh, and uh, and I'm lucky in that uh, I have the kind of fan base that that uh, a lot of them do love a lot of different kinds of music. And so right. and 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 I'm lucky enough to have, have had a history of doing uh, electric music that's colored by acoustic instruments. Right. You know or has an acoustic side to it, like Alice in Chains has always had that. Um, and uh, my music in the past comes with the fall, things like that. Even going back to the early 90s and, and, and a thing I did called No Walls back in, you know, from 88 to about 92. That that music had acoustic elements in it as well. We were always pulling from the Zeppelin thing of you can have acoustic instruments, but they can be heavy and they can rock too. Um, so <clears throat> it's always been a part of what I did, but showcasing it in this way where it's stripped down one guitar one voice for an entire album it gets me into a new path you know that can that that i can always uh rejoin whenever i want and it's 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 really been a blessing i mean there was a lot of trepidation before putting it out that you know there's always that thing of like what if this doesn't fly you know what if it is too much of a departure for for too many of the people um you know at least I can say I've done it, you know, but <clears throat> the fact that it's gone so well and the fact that the shows have gone so well, it's just been uh, really, uh, you know, some, I mean, it, easily one of the proudest moments of my whole career to date, you know, and, and so it's, it's been, been a real uh, blessing that I don't take for granted, you know. Uh, that's amazing. So you were so were you, your first band was a like a hardcore punk band am i right yeah 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 the very first band uh was was uh myself and and a couple of neighborhood kids uh, who lived a street over from me and that band was called avoc awareness void of chaos and i had just got, <laughs> i had just, <laughs> no good punk band is uh <laughs> you, you got to you you got to have the uh you know the 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 long name but broken down into the letters. Yeah, had that back in the band. There was T S O L. There was you know there was there My, was there was <laughs> acronym bands and I and I loved the four letter acronym you know like yeah. and so I I did the A V O C and um and uh, anyhow I I had just I I was just getting into the hardcore hardcore just really hit you know um, in America as far as the underground. And I had I had started buying the singles by a lot of the bands that, you know, everyone loves and grew to be influenced by who was into that music then. Um, Black Flag and, and I'd had the Bad Brains of Rourke's set, um, things like that. And I had been into the earlier punk rock, you know, before that, the stuff out of New York and the stuff out of England, the Ramones and the Sex Pistols and the Clash, um, those kind of bands. But hardcore was something different and and when you got into that you really set yourself apart with everything that goes along with that you know i mean and and it was it could be even quite dangerous you know, sure. <laughs> to be to be interested in or be identified with that but in the i was a sophomore in high school and uh the school i attended at the time i was definitely an outcast you know and the only two other kids in the school would really, you know, give me the time of day was this one kid who was in the marching band and he became the drummer of ABOC. And this other kid who was a stoner who kind of got along with everybody. He could he, he was enough of a jock that he could get on with the jocks. He was enough of a stone guy that he could get into the stoners. He, he, he was easygoing. Everybody kind of liked him, but he wasn't a part of any crowd exclusively. And he'd never played an instrument before. And I said, well, I have a bass, you know, I play guitar, but I also have a bass. You could play the bass and I could show you it's more just one note at a time, you know. And he was his family is from Barbados. And so he naturally had an affinity for reggae music and Caribbean music. And so I was like, man, I think I think you could do this, you know. So those two guys, man, neighborhood guys, we started getting together. I brought them to my house first. And started playing in the singles of the bands I liked. I started playing in the six pack single from Black Flag and the Bad Brains Work cassette. Oh. And you know, and 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 then we started getting together at the drummer's house where he had his drum kit set up, and that became ABOC. We made our first recordings in his basement. 
And with those recordings made on a ghetto blaster, I got my first gigs in the city with that band and that the one club that would have us called 688. And uh, from there, it just, it just uh, became like, wow, once I got a taste of what it meant to be on stage, you know, even if it was difficult and sometimes humiliating, you know, because like, you know, things go wrong. You're a kid. You don't know how to, yeah. you know. You step on it. You don't have your cord going through your strap. You step on it. You unplug. You don't know what the fuck our happened. Our second gig, dude, our second show, we opened up for the Circle Jerks. Jesus. So it was just a huge thing. My second time on stage, I'm opening for one of the bands that, you know, were my heroes. And we, just, I had a huge, like, equipment malfunction. Well, first of all, our drummer got grounded. <laughs> so... We get to sound check. He doesn't show up. And I, I, you know, back then it's 1983. So I had to call the phone booth. I'd get on the phone booth and, you know, call. No, it was a, no, it was a pay phone in the doorway of 688. So I get on the pay phone. I'm like, what's going on? His brother answered the phone and he's like, yeah, he got grounded. And I'm like, I'm like, no, 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 please. I'm like, you got to talk to your mom. You got to convince her. This is really important. This is the circle jerks. You know, so I'm trying to impress upon. He's like, that's why he got grounded. How important <laughs> the circle jerks are, you know. And anyway, because Ricky couldn't even come to the phone. My drummer couldn't. Even, he wasn't allowed on the phone. Nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> meantime, we're stuck at Soundcheck. We got a gig to do, and the only other hardcore band in Atlanta at the time was a group called DDT. And so, I convinced. Well, I didn't really have to convince because we were we were solidarity. There was solidarity. It seems so small. And DDT were guys that I kind of they were older than we were. And so I, I looked up to them a little bit. And the drummer, Greg Somas, was like the Keith Moon of Atlanta. So he was kind of a guy that I looked at as like, man, that guy's the ultimate, you know. Like if you look at Chuck Biscuits from the early, Greg kind of had that thing, just savage, like just nuts, you know. And but Greg was there. Right. He was there because it was only, you know, there were so few gigs that came through Atlanta. You know, anytime there was anybody playing, you, you, you know, you were, people were hanging around. And I was like, Greg, man, our drum was grounded. Can you hear? So he agreed to sit in. But he didn't know any of our songs because we were just starting, you know. And so I tried to explain to him, like, how the first song went with the arrangement, like, in the dressing room. <laughs> this is just like, this is like minutes before we have to go on. And finally, the guy comes by the door and is like, it's time. <laughs> We do like the, the 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 executioners walk to the gallows, <laughs> like, and and we start the first song and and you know it kind of started with this '60s beat like Ticket to Ride, you know, but then it goes into thrash. Yeah, when we got to the '60s. When we got to the thrash part. It was it was game on, boy. Greg took off like a rocket. We'd never played it that fast, and it was also it was like oh god, it was like. Guys who've been used to driving a Volkswagen, suddenly you were in a Lamborghini, you know what I mean? And we're flying. And so we got through that first song, barely, you know. And then my freaking amp starts making this noise. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't know what was wrong. Now, looking back, I know it was wrong. One of the batteries was dying in my distortion box. And so it just started making this howling feedback, you know. And so, but I didn't know what was wrong at the time. So I'm just, I'm just like... Every time you hear a song, it's just that screaming, like not the musical feedback that you control, control like Hendrix, you know, which I love doing. Sure. It wasn't that, just that total like, you know. And, um, and so anyway, we got through a couple songs, but it was just like, oh God, this is like such a borderline train wreck, even for us, you know. <laughs> like, and then I see my drummer's brother coming down through the crowd and then behind him, I see our drummer. And so he had prevailed upon his mom to let him come down and he gets up and we finished the set. But by then everybody, we're also shaking cause we're just all like, oh, you know, but we made it through the gig and uh, you know, and by then, you know, you're bitten by the bug. There's nothing you can do. It's like, that's it. You're, you're on, you know, and that band evolved into the band that most people know as being, my early group, Neon Christ, you know, and that band, Neon Christ kind of went on to make some noise that people still care about and talk about and that kind of thing, which is amazing to me. But yeah, it's true. And so are there recordings of um, I, I found, I think 
one song on Spotify, one Neon Christ song, um, but maybe I was looking at the era. And so that one song was probably part of the Peace War compilation because we got asked by Jello Biafra, the Dead Kennedys, to be a part of that compilation. Because again, everybody knew everybody back then. And, you know, your, your, your heroes became acquaintances and sometimes even friends, you know. And uh, so Jello wrote to us <laughs> back when you wrote letters, you know. That's and amazing. he wrote to us and he said, we, we were about to put this compilation to bed, the Peace War compilation to bed. And we realized we had no Neon Christ. Would you guys, you, you know, please submit something? And it happened that we had just, uh, well, we had put out an EP earlier that year. This was like 1984. We put out an EP in early 84. But then we went back in the studio and recorded. We had some new songs, you know. And we went back in and did four new songs produced by Nick Jameson, the producer of Fog Hat. Um, and, How uh, did he like that? I'm sure, like most people, uh, he probably thought, what am I doing here? You know, because, I mean, nobody really understood that music, you know. People, you know, most rock producers thought this is pure noise, you know. Right. I mean, Nick was actually cool for, for a guy who came from where he came from, like 70s rock. He was actually cool. And, but most people were like, yeah, this is horrendous. You know, like, what, what are you guys doing? What am I doing here? This is ridiculous, you know. Um, but yeah, we, those four songs that Nick Jameson did uh, actually are pretty cool. I mean, it, and, and we, we put one of those on the Peace War compilation. We sent one of those to Jello and, and the guys putting out the Peace compilation. That's the one that kind of, that compilation has uh, been through many, many pressings. And that's probably why it's on Spotify, because they reissued it recently. Um, and uh, But actually, the guys in Neon Christ, all four of us are, have been talking for a while about about what we can do with our short but you know uh important to some people catalog and uh, and what we could do with songs that were never were written back then but were never properly recorded because our latter day material by the people who knew the band and saw the band back then it's widely it's widely uh considered that our latter day material was the best stuff and, and we broke up before we recorded it. So there's this thing of, should we even attempt, you know, because all four of us are still here, you know, unlike a lot of our contemporaries, you know, right. all four of us are still alive. And so should we, could we even attempt to do that stuff again? And the only reason that's even a possibility is because we did actually get together once and reunite for uh, a show in 2008. And, um, and it was amazing because all these kids who weren't even born yet flooded this room and they were just, it was just tornado of kids like knocking over the PA and they knew, they knew the songs. It was amazing. They even knew songs that again were never recorded back then properly. They knew them from the live tapes. So wow. it kind of begged the question, maybe we should give this material its proper due and try to record it in some way. But again, that idea has come and gone over since 2008. It's come and gone a lot. I've obviously been very busy. The other guys have lives of their own. But it's something we are still considering because, um, and even and whether we do that or not, we still do want to curate the 1984 material that we did because it's never been issued on any digital medium. It never came out on CD. You know, the whole CD era came and went <laughs> with Neon Christ not being a part of it so right. it's vinyl and that's it is that you know, right one song of yeah I and mean, we put out the ep back in 84 we put out the, the they, they put out the piece compilation in in 84 85 i think and uh and that's it so I, our drummer actually did put out a vinyl reissue of the first ep and then the four songs we did later that year that never had come out in 1990 but we've been a vinyl band We've never been a digital band, not so on CD, in, not on streaming, nothing. The whole thing with uh, people selling like uh, mass produced cassette demos happened even later, right? So it was all seven inches or vinyl? Yeah, in our, our day, it was you put out vinyl, 
you know um we we were we were pre-cassette even really being a thing you know i um, mean you know people put out demo tapes or not put out but the people had demo tapes that they would circulate and there was tape trading in punk rock just like there was tape trading in the in the speed metal world the underground speed metal world that's how we all first heard metallica yeah you know because that was when metal and punk first began kind of crossing over and there was still a lot of um you know uh division between the groups and still a lot of like fighting you know if you showed up at a punk show with long hair you would get your you know get into a confrontation with some people or vice versa if a punk went to a metal show same thing um but meanwhile the musicians were leading the way into hey how can we like combine these two things so like our friends and in, in, we, we had a brother band back then neon christ had a brother band coc i was gonna say dri like, coc crumb suckers all these bands well to all those guys and, and dri were were very good to neon christ because i mean first of all we freaking idolize those guys man that that's the 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 dirty rotten oh, record yeah you know both on the seven inch and when they put it out we re released it on a 12 inch later that year that was one of our pivotal records man when we got that we were like whoa you know because we wanted to play f yeah it was all about playing fast right and they were they were like they were like a bullet train man and and so tight and just so awesome so we heard that record. We were like, man, that's goals right there. And and then they came through town on that first tour that they ever did. And we, you know, we were obviously, we went to the show, man. And I remember they like, they showed up in the van. They were late. They drove in, I think, from Texas, straight from Texas, like, you know, 20 hours, man. Like one hardcore haul they did. They showed up in the van, pulled up right outside. By that time, a club called the Metroplex had opened in Atlanta. That was the all, first all ages place here. And that was... Once that happened, man, Neon Christ and the whole scene kind of grew up around us and around DDT because now kids had a place to go. But DRI pulled up to the Metroplex and got right out of the van after 18, 20 hours being trapped in the van, set right up. They put their set list on the wall. I remember the set list rolled down the wall, down across, it was like a scroll. It like went down, <laughs> down the floor. Because they had so many songs, man, because their songs were like 30 seconds long, you know what I mean? But they played a million of them, and they were so tight and so fast. But I love DRI, and, and we handed them the first demo tape Neon Christ ever did. And they, they took that demo tape all up the East Coast with them and everywhere with them on tour, and they played it for everybody. So, the like, a few months later, when Neon Christ put out our record, and when we were ready to do a tour of our own... We called people and they were like, oh, yeah, DRI, they told us about you. Yeah, you know. And again, everything was so small. So there was like one kid in Pittsburgh. There was one kid in Philadelphia. There was one, you know, there was a couple people in New York. There was, you know, you went to Reed Mullen in Raleigh. Reed Mullen from COC was the Raleigh connection, you know. Jimmy Deemer, the drummer in Neon Christ, was the Atlanta connection. We had all these things and everybody had their thing. In L.A., it was Chuck Dukowski from Black Flag. In San Francisco, it was Jello Biafra from Dead Kennedys. So we all had, you know... In, uh, in the Midwest, like in, uh, and especially like when you got to like, um, like a Detroit area, like Michigan to like the, to, to like Ohio, Corey Rusk from the, from the Necros, you know, but we all started connecting. We all had the same phone numbers. So, but DRI had hipped people to us. So when we called up, we weren't totally cold calling. So it was huge, man, for us. Not huge, like in terms of like commercial business, but it was huge in terms of personal relationships because that's all you had. Didn't come but, around. Um, you didn't have the internet and email back then. It was none of that. Yeah, you had none of that, and and you were sleeping on people's floors. You're so going they on had tour to, with the Thomas Guide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. You went on tour with a straight up map, and you slept on people's floors. So they had to trust you. You know, somebody had to vouch for you. You know what I mean? And um, so DRI was very important to us. COC was very important to us because they were from Raleigh. They were like another Southeast band and they were killing it. You know, COC, again, they were a bit older than us. And so we looked up to them and uh, they, they could tour more. You know, see when Neon Christ first did our East Coast tour, I wasn't old enough to drive a car yet. 
our drummer Jimmy wasn't old enough to drive a car yet. Really? So, yeah. So our bass player and our singer were old enough to drive, and they got our singer got one of his friends to come down from uh, where he was from up in uh, Minneapolis area, and that guy came down. So the three of them, our our bass player, our singer, and our singer's friend, could do the driving, and uh, you know. But COC, they were all older. They could drive and everybody, you know, like they, they could straight up tour, you know. And Reed, he had like, he had connections. His family had a family business. So Reed had, he had resources to put into the scene, you know. And uh, COC were able to make a real mark, you know. And, and, and I say that because, you know, Reed Mullen, he died a few months ago. And it was just one of the biggest losses because... <clears throat> because he was uh it's hard to describe how important he was back then like not just to that band and to the music that band made but also in the early days of the scene most people know coc from about 1990 on they know coc with pepper keenan and all you know and the more metal southern rock hybrid thing they ended up doing in the 90s on but man the CO's and that's cool you know i love pepper and i love all those guys man but like but like I'm talking about 1983 COC. You know what I mean? I'm talking about the COC almost like very few people knew because they hadn't started really touring yet. Those are the guys that we used to bro down with. And Mike Dean and I go back back to then. Reed Mullen and I go back to then. You know, Woody Weatherman and I go back to then. And that's the kind of thing you can't you can't quantify what that means we were all kids and we were all learning how to do this and like i said we looked up to them we used to play raleigh because of them they used to play atlanta because of us and you know when we would play raleigh we would headline and when they would come here they would have and i mean they were like i said they were they ruled it man when by the time they put out that first record eye for an eye and that was cool but when when right after that when 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 uh their singer Eric left and they became a three piece with Mike Reed and Woody and they did that animosity music. We saw that before that was out. Like we saw them doing that music before it was out as a three piece. And it was like, man, they jumped to another level. And then they put out that animosity record. And again, that was punk and metal beginning to come together in a way that it had not done before. And they were really important for that. I mean, I think they were, they were really important and people talk about a lot of other bands like that record was important to people who know but it seems to me like it still doesn't quite it's a classic to people who know but it still doesn't get quite the credit it deserves because when that came out it was like it was another it was it was a, a real like clarion call you know they were they were great they were great <clears throat> Do you do you know which recording that cover? Because it was called something else, but they did a cover of Green Man Alishi. Well, they used to do Green Man Alishi back in eighty two, eighty three. Like they used to do it back then. That's what I'm saying. Like COC way before it was hip to acknowledge that you love Black Sabbath. They wore it on their sleeve. Like they really wore it on their sleeve. Like nobody else that we knew was wearing it on their sleeve like that. You know what I mean? That was like playing punk. That was thrash and punk. COC would do, um, what's the uh, beginning of uh, the song of volume for us? That was, that cornucopia song. They would do the beginning of that song before they were one of their thrash songs. Like they would straight up quote Black Sabbath and then they go into their tune. Nobody else was doing that, you know? Right. And like, they they even the the whole like approach to their punk music was metalized you know what i mean like the way they would the way they would hit chords and stuff it was real sabbathy man and like uh so they yeah and they did green manalishi the way the priest version they kind of did the green manalishi yeah they used to cover it back when eric was in the band back in 82 83 like they were they were way ahead on that they were way ahead on that <clears throat> oh, that's it's funny. Um, first, that I like putting it in perspective, you're 15 and going on tour, 
getting in a van yeah. with your friends. Only a couple yeah. of you are even old enough to get a license. But, yeah. but you're looking up to these guys because they're like 18, 17, 18. They seem like grown ass mm -hmm. men to you. Yeah, yeah. Anybody that was 19, 20 years old was like, yeah, you're in a you're a grown up, you know, and you can you can do stuff that we can't even think about doing. Like you you can have a beer. <laughs> right. You know shit that <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like yeah, you know, you actually have a girlfriend. You know what I mean? Like right. maybe you live with a girl. You know, like it's just it's real like you know what I'm saying? It's like real grown up stuff. Right. Yeah. Uh the other thing that that I was thinking about as you're telling me these stories is I wonder what if you were to flash back or you, you were able to tap into your 15 year old self, if you would believe that you would have made an acoustic album and been so happy about it. Right. Because when you're a kid, you think heavy is one thing, right? Heavy is yeah. heavy. It's heavy as, is like black Sabbath or right. heavy as black flag. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, I was um, I loved all kinds of music always. And I was very lucky in that uh, the first I mean, I, I was exposed to a lot of great music, even as a really small child, like Washington, D.C., where I'm from, to grow up in, in that town at that time was to be exposed to a, a lot of great music, man, that was even just on the radio, like on commercial radio, you know. So. Uh, you know, I was hearing the, I was hearing Marvin Gaye and Earth, Wind and & Fire and, 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 and Stevie Wonder and, and uh, you know, and all of that as a really little kid. And also they would play David Bowie on black radio back then, like, you know, the, the Young Americans album. They play fame on the soul stations. And, and, um, and uh, so, you know, exposed to cool music that you take for granted you don't even you just know you like it you don't even know like this is so exceptional you know and like in in 20 years you're gonna realize this is like whoa you know but it was great to be exposed to that and then and this is before i even considered playing music and by the time i was about eight years old i heard hendrix and that's what made me want to play music you know so i was i came into it kind of from an eclectic standpoint an eclectic worldview and i came at it from the top i think you know what i'm saying it's like the guy that inspired me is still the guy who to me was the best at electric guitar you know and so i started at the top and it's all just been a thing of trying to come to grips with that ever since so would 15 year old me be surprised at me putting out an all acoustic album? Yeah, very likely so. But at the same time, um, I always wanted to be a, a well rounded musician. And even in the punk rock days, I love the heaviest, the noisiest, the craziest. But I always appreciated everything else too, you know? And so I was listening to Ornette Coleman when I was 11, you know? I was listening to King Crimson back then, and, and, and I was listening to the Stooges. And I still love, you know, my mother's Carol King Tapestry record, you know? <clears throat> and so... Yeah, what, what were your folks listening to in the house? Because record players, I mean, it seems like music happened a lot more in households in the 60s and 70s and even 80s um, because yeah. <laughs> cable TV wasn't a thing. And the internet yeah. wasn't a thing. and Right. You had three channels and you had the family record player. You know, you had three channels on TV and the family record player that was kind of sat in the living room. Some uh -huh. people had the console, you know, <laughs> like my grandparents had the console. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, my, my mom, like I said, she loved Roberta Flack, Carol King. You know, that was what she would be playing all the time when I was really small. Um, the Tapestry album played every day for about a year That's so in weird. our apartment. You know, every day I'd wake up, you know, I feel the earth move under my feet. Every morning for like a year and a half, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and again, you know, Roberta Flack, she used to go see Roberta Flack when Roberta was a local act and, and playing around the D.C., Maryland area. So when Roberta was playing his clubs before she got signed, my mother and her best friend Diane would go and see her. You know, they talked to her and everything. They knew they knew, you know, like there was a small like group of people that were regulars and going to see Roberta back then. 
Yeah. And uh, my mom. So and when Roberta put out records and started getting famous, like my mother just loved it. You know, she felt vindicated. Like, yeah, I was I always loved this gal. I knew she was going to do it, you know, and uh, we had her records playing and, and you know, we had Donny Hathaway, you know, so that was what was going on. And, and, and my uh, my father, he loved everything from my, my, my biological dad loved everything from like Bo Diddley, Thelonious Monk. You know, uh, but he also loved like Johnny Mathis, you know. So, I mean, he really went from the really adventurous to the really like borderline, like, uh, you know, schlock. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, but, you know, he loved it. My stepfather, he had, uh, you know, again, he had the Crusaders, you know, what I mean, stuff like that. Like a lot of like jazz, but not real challenging jazz, more like the just good music played well you know smooth but not too smooth sure you know <clears throat> i didn't get exposed to much jazz growing up until i had like a a, a music teacher in school who was a like a jazz yeah. drummer yeah yeah um but yeah music from a very early age was super super important did you i mean yeah at that time, like, how old were you at, at this point? And when did you leave D.C.? When did you leave the area? Well, yeah, like I said, I started playing guitar at eight years old. Um, uh, eight! A, a cousin moved in with my mom. Yeah, yeah, I was eight. And, yeah, a cousin moved in with my mom and, uh, and me. And uh, my mom was a school teacher, and, and, and so she was always, you know, into children's welfare and things like that. And so she took in kids all the time students of hers i'm gonna go down to the basement because the the rain is hitting the skylight really hard i know it's probably hard to hear me um but so hey do you have a uh, set of headphones you're on your phone yeah i am and my headphones are hidden away somewhere i'm not sure where they are right now um but uh, oh, okay. but can you can you hear me okay if I are, are you okay audio wise? I can hear you okay. Sometimes when I talk, the noise cancellation will will block your voice. Yeah, yeah, um, it's okay. Um, I'll just keep my mouth shut. Yeah, my mom was 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 a school teacher, so she took in uh, and she was in the D.C. public school system. So it was it was always a challenge to get the kids what they needed, and uh, she was all and, and a lot of them had bad home lives and things. She was taking in kids a lot and helping out being a surrogate parent. So when my cousin was having a tough time with his folks, he was family, you know what I mean? So it was a no brainer, you, you know, come with us, you know? And, and so he brought his little record collection with him. He's 10 years older than I am. So he's 18, I'm eight. And <clears throat> so he had his very small, but very potent record collection. And it was like Santana and Roy Ayers and, 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 you know, war and like uh, weather report, and the first Jaco Pastorius album, right when it came out, and the, you know, but he had Hendrix Band of Gypsies, so that was the one that set me off, man. It was like he started playing that one day. I had a little uh, Show and Tell record player. I remember Show and Tell, like it was a little screen and it had a record player on top, and he put the Hendrix record on there. It was all warped, you know, because his records had been mishandled at his his folks' place, and but I it still got the message across because it was like you know what is going on there? And I started like just bombarding him with all these questions. Like, wow, is he doing that with a guitar? Like, what? You know, he was explaining like feedback and Stratocasters and Marshall stacks. And, and it was like, whoa. And, and at a certain point it was just like, it really captured my imagination. And, and, you know, my, my cousin's records were missing their, a lot of their covers, you know? So I didn't know what Hendrix looked like at all. And in fact, my cousin used to draw his own like psychedelic, drawings in place of the album covers he would draw on the paper sleeve to make it you know just interesting in lieu of a cover but i still we didn't you know i know what hendrix looked like so he went to the library and he photocopied old rolling stone magazines and he brought back these photographs and it was like whoa man you know he looks like us like wow you know it was like so that was really eye-opening and inspiring and it was like well this is great and then right around then like as if divine intervention like monterey pop came on tv and so my cousin and his friends who were his age made this plan you know we're gonna all go over to cedric's house and we're gonna watch monterey pop and they 
you know, they rented a TV and everything, you know, like where you could do the easy rental, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they rented a big old console television to watch it on. And we all went over there to this guy's apartment and, you know, they all lit up and everything. And they were getting stoned and stuff. And we waited through all the other acts and finally, finally Hendrix came on. And this is, again, my first time really seeing him like do his act, you know? And I was, and it's just the one song, it's a wild thing, but I was just like, whoa. Like, I mean, my mind was blown already from the band of gypsies, but once I saw him do his act and he set the guitar on fire and all of that, it was just like, oh yeah, okay, I'm done. This is, this is it. This is it. This is what I'm doing. So it became a, a lifelong thing from that time on. And, and it was cool because I had found a guitar in my grandmother's basement that was an old beat up acoustic nylon string, the cliche, you know what I mean? The strings a mile high, fretboard, the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? But I got it together. It only had like, you know, four strings on it. But I got it together enough to where finally my cousin, he, he you know, he's at the age where, you know, you have to figure out what you're going to do with your life. And so he joined the Navy, you know, and with his first paycheck from the Navy, he bought me a Fender Mustang. Really? And showed me how to, yeah, man. Is and he showed still me how around? to wire it. Yeah, he is, man. He is. He is. He is still, he's still living. Fell on some hard times, you know, but man, like, you know, the, <laughs> there's always, there's always, there's always tomorrow, you know, but like he, he, he showed me how to wire this thing through the stereo as an amp so I could play along yeah. with the records. That's how I learned, you know, to play. I would just jam along with the Isley Brothers or, you know, chic you know what i mean yeah or a little later you know i got hit to you know the 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 led zeppelin and the, and the van halen you know and all of that and uh you know so that's how i learned to play you know so were you that's it. when you were learning those because there's a lot of like complex chord stuff going on in like chic songs were you playing the bass line yes. essentially or like the vocal melody, that kind of thing at first? What I would do is I would try to figure out what Nile Rodgers was doing quarterly. And I didn't always get it exactly right. I might get the top notes. I might not get all the middle notes. You know what I'm saying? Like I found out later, you know what I'm saying? Because once I knew, once I really learned what he was doing. But like, you know, you didn't have videos then. You didn't have anything. All you had was the record. You had to figure it out by ear. In fact, it was a... A real, like like I said, Monterey Pop came on TV. These guys made it an event. Like, we're going to rent a television. We're going to go to this one guy's house. It's an event when somebody would come on TV back then. Like, if you had a, like, when the late night shows would have a musical guest that you were interested in, yeah. it was like a bonanza because you never saw people on TV. Like, they could really, you know, you had Midnight Special. You had Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. You had Saturday Night Live, you know. Fridays for a hot minute, they you know they were on, but it was a big deal. You did not have access to that stuff all the time, right. and you had no way to record it. So if King Crimson came on Fridays, I'd have to watch really close, like the TV, like Adrian Blue, what he's doing, and I would try to like, or Robert Fripp, and I would try to record on a cassette player, just audio, just so I could like have the visual in my mind of what I saw once, you know. And then, like, here's the audio. Yes, I have the record, but here's how I did it live. And I taped it off the TV, <laughs> you know, put the mic up to the TV speaker. That's how you had to roll then. And, like, yeah. that's what I did. But, like, you know, to, to, to have, like, any kind of a visual was super, super important. But you so rarely had it that most of the time I was just jamming along with records getting it right sometimes, getting it wrong sometimes, but doing my own. This was the other thing that was cool about it, though, is I would do my own version of it, right. you know, which is very punk rock before I knew what punk rock really was. It was like, I'm going to do my thing with it. And also what I was doing was I was jamming with the record. So it wasn't like just I'm going to learn your parts. It was, no, I'm going to be a member of this band That's and I'm going to play my parts to what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was like that. That's how I really learned. It was like, I'm really jamming with whoever, you know? And the other thing that was, was key though, I have to mention too, along with all this really, really cool, you know, eclectic and more complex music. W another thing that was really important in the very early days in my evolution was Kiss because they were perfect. You know what I mean? Like, it was perfect. I was one of those nine, 10-year-olds that got totally absorbed by it because 
I love comic books, I love superheroes, and I love guitar. They were made for me. And That's Ace right. Freely, Ace Freely was like a godsend because what he was doing was so cool and still is cool to me. I still will put on a live or a live two uh, or Hotter Than Hell, the studio album, and honest to God, fucking flip out at how cool it is. You know, his leads were so well composed and they're perfect what they're... i loved about them what what i loved about them was that there was hope that you could play those you know what i'm saying <laughs> like there wasn't it was way more intimidating to think about trying to tackle something hendrix was doing or like in the court or, of the crimson king or fucking heart of the yeah, sunrise like stuff robert Fripp was doing and stuff or stuff like yeah you know like it was way more like, oh god, that's more that's that's a that's a wish, you know. But with Kiss, it was sort of like, I think he's doing this, and you could like play that and play with the record, and no, he is doing that, you know what I mean? Like, I might not do it as fast or as cool as he's doing it, but I can play that, you know. It was really important. Again, before punk rock came for me, Kiss was huge, you know. I remember <laughs> when I made the revelation of when I'm when I was learning. Because, you know, guitar magazines had become popular by the time I got a guitar. So I learned a lot yes. from, like, tabs and that kind of stuff, you know? Um, yes. And it all seemed so difficult to me. It was all, it was pretty complex. And I, you know, it's just like a, a bunch of numbers. And you're like, uh, like, I only have to press down these three fingers. It doesn't imply, it doesn't tell you, like, well, sure, you're only playing those three notes, but you're really holding down this chord shape, you know? So it's very, right, that was right. very confusing to me. But when it came to learning Kiss songs, I had this revelation where, like, when I realized everything that they do is the simplest version of whatever the idea, you know, like you have this idea of yeah. this killer riff. It's usually just like it's a it's a bar chord or a power chord or just one finger across two or three strings just eh, nah, 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 right it's like yeah real yep basic but yeah but and cool really like cool, the stooges though. cool like the mc5 cool like all yep. that shit yes yes Ugh. i agree i agree and and again the the songs were so well arranged you know like the the really you know the especially the early like really really good when they were hungry you know what i mean like when they were just really like we have to prove ourselves those songs are really like well arranged and very like very cool and and there actually is some it there there's some simple stuff and then there's some kind of like deceptively simple stuff where it's like oh that sounds simple but what they're actually doing is kind of like this thing where paul is maybe hitting two or three notes of the chord and Ace is hitting two or three other notes of the chord, but together it's making this really killer thing, you know? Yeah. Or Paul's playing in one octave, Ace is playing in the other. Like, there's there's some great, great, great stuff going on there, in my view. And again, the leads that Ace composed, they're freaking brilliant. I mean, Strange Ways off Hotter Than Hell, that's ridiculous. Like, that's awesome. Paul you know? doesn't get um, the the respect that I think he deserves as a vocalist either, because I think he's got a great voice. And as a guitar player, because because again, he's he's writing a lot of that stuff, and you know, and and I get the feeling had a real uh, you know idea of how he wanted it arranged, like you know, so these songs like "Got to Choose" and things like that, those. Those really great Paul Stanley songs are like, you know, I don't, I don't feel like he gets the credit as a songwriter. You know what I mean? Like, I, I really feel like, yeah, just as an all-around dude who can, who can come up with a tune, play it, sing it. It's, it's cool. The chords are cool. The parts are cool. The, 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 the vocal is great. The chorus is great. He doesn't get enough credit, I don't think. You know, Neon Christ used to do "Got to Choose," so right. at the at the height of the punk rock thing, we would do our whole set, and then at the end, we might throw in "Got to Choose," because I just thought it was that cool. Even then, in '84, '85, I was like, you know what? 
this is great music to me. And I don't care if y'all think it's ironic, you know, you know what I'm saying? Or if yeah. y'all think we're, you know, taking the piss out of Kiss, I'm really not. <laughs> this is killer. You know? I know you're not into them anymore because they're not wearing their makeup, but check this out. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about the early kiss that when they were wearing their makeup, and that's what time it is right now, you know? Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Uh, grow in the 70s, you know, I, I would borrow my uncle's eight tracks, and he had he had Dynasty, and he had mm -hmm. Alive and Alive 2. And he also had the record, and I remember opening up that gatefold and just looking at that and just thinking that I want to do, like, this is what I want to do. I want to do this. I yeah. remember the first time I stood on a stage in, you know, because I had played a, a bunch of big shows, and but I remember the first time I played an, like a, an arena show and I looked out and I was like, you know, like, I mean, the hair on my arm standing up right now thinking about that moment is crazy because it looked like that. It was that. It was yeah, that. right, right. Yeah. I mean, nobody knew our songs like they knew Kiss's songs. But <laughs> yeah. uh, they weren't screaming for us the same way, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who yeah. cares? This is my fantasy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right, right, right. So, did you... Pardon me for not knowing. Did you, did you play guitar in those bands and sing, or did you just play guitar? In the early days, well, the very first band, AVOC, I play guitar and sing. We were just a three-piece, and, uh, you know, so it was left to me to default. But I wouldn't call it singing because I was trying to imitate Des Kadena from Black Flag. <laughs> right. So, you know, you wrote songs more or less to be, I mean, well, see, AVOC played, played hardcore, but we also played reggae because we were really inspired by the Bad Brains who could do both. And I, again, like I said, I day? came... Did did you see them? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Best live band I've ever seen to this day. When at them in their prime, there's nothing that can touch that, like, for me. You know, as far as bands I've seen in the room, where I was in the room, where it was happening, there's nobody to touch them. And uh, I've seen a lot of stuff, but that that still holds the, the crown. Uh, I saw the Bad Brains one time turn away the freaking Riot Squad in, in, Santa, in Santa Barbara. They, the Riot Squad came in to stop the show. Bad Brains set up, like, like nothing was happening. They set up like another day at the office. They never once acknowledged the presence of a whole phalanx of riot squad that came into the venue, sealed off the entrances, and were lining the walls, ready to beat the ass of everybody in that room. They never acknowledged it was happening. That's how badass they were. Meanwhile, there's this whole confrontation going on that's brewing between the audience, who's pissed, that the that that they that they're there, there's the, the people who got trapped outside when they seal the entrances. The people who want to go take a an air break or whatever, get get a get a smoke or whatever, they can't get back in. We, the people who got trapped inside, can't get out, and it's really tense. And there's a serious argument going on between the promoter and the captain of the squad. Bad brains just they're just setting up, and then they start playing. And they start that song, Fearless Vampire Killers. They're the fucking and, and greatest of all time. Dude, dude, the place went off like a fucking bomb hit it. Like it was like, again, I saw, I've seen some gigs, man, but I've never seen anything like that to this day. Like I've played some gigs, you know what I'm saying? I've, I've, I still can't think of a moment that tops that for me, though, because it just was so charged the atmosphere was so charged everything that was going on in the room was so charged and when they when they played that song specifically too it was like i've i've just never experienced anything like that man and they kept and then they they went from there into that song i you know and the place was so ballistic this was like a community center that they were that we were my i had, i was in a band called blast by then um, I Neon Christ had broken up. I moved to California to get out of Atlanta. Some heavy shit was going down in Atlanta at the time, and I left. Joined Blast, who I liked a lot. You know, the first band I ever joined that I didn't start myself. 
and blast were they were santa cruz guys you know and they played you know we played the black flag inspired sabbath inspired fucking rock you know what i mean like we fucking they they understood and i understood that dan armstrong like through solid state amp thing better than anybody so yeah. we were made for one another you know reed mullen is who told them about me so it was like yeah you guys you know your guy Steve Stevenson just left. You know who you need. You need this guy. You know from the Cry. So we got together. We put out a record on SST, uh, their second album. It's in my It's in my blood. And Dave Grohl just remixed that album a few years ago. And 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 uh, Southern Lord put it out as Blood. And uh, and it's yeah it's a, it's a it's a fucking strong album. But anyway, we we were opening for the Bad Brains at this gig. So Santa Barbara Community Center the place that has like stairs leading up to the stage one of those it's like it's like not a venue for music especially for you know punk music it's a venue for like and now the most improved student award goes to you know it's like community that theater kind of you know? thing. yeah like community theater or like high school awards or whatever you know so the stairs became just part of the landscape for the pit, you know? The, the pit would go across the floor, up the stairs, down the stairs, and back across the floor again. Like, the circle was on a slant, you know what I mean? And so the bad brains are fucking... I mean, the crowd was amazing for, for us, too, but when the, when, when the riot squad came in and they poured the gasoline on the situation, then the bad brains poured the freaking lighter fluid and then lit the match on the situation it really became a crucial thing and like so when their second song they're playing that song i the arguments intensifying between the captain and the promoter and like uh, the you know he's just trying to persuade you know the guy like let him just play a few songs you know i mean this is like you know we're almost there we're almost home just let us finish out what we started here and we'll all go away peacefully you know hey, nobody's no doing anything nobody but see, that's never the way it operated back then. Those guys wanted trouble. You know what I'm saying? They, that's why they came there, you know? And so... Some shit never changes, man. <laughs> right. So, so it's like... So it, it, it gets real crazy. I'm seeing these kids taunting the guys up against the, the soldiers on the wall. They're like literally... They're singing along with the song, but they're also like kind of, yeah, motherfucker, fuck it, come on! You know what I mean? Like, And Bad Brains, again, HR never acknowledges any of it it's so powerful so then the captain orders the sound cut off he cuts the pa hr again never acknowledging what's happening in a literal way he just he just slams the mic down on the ground it shatters into a million pieces and then he just starts conducting the crowd like a fucking choir so now it's like yeah motherfucker, we don't need a pa you know what i mean and like Dude, it got so crazy that eventually those motherfuckers just turned around and left. They were like, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not. This is going to become a real bloodbath. And we might, we'll, 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 we'll still win, but the casualties on our side will be so bad you know, that we won't be able to justify it. You know what I mean? Like, we can't justify the fucking garnish. <laughs> and they fucking left through the door they came in. And the PA got turned back on gig went on like normal and again the bad brains even after all this drama never acknowledged that anything took place out of the ordinary they never did that was the most badass shit about as badass as the whole thing was that is what sticks in my mind hr never mentioned a word about it you know and it was just like we are so connected to something so much more powerful that to acknowledge the presence of these pissants who came in and tried to interrupt our thing would be beneath us. You know, we're just going to keep. And so when, when the PA came back on, he just, he never acknowledged that it was even off. He got another, he, mic. He got another mic and they just played their next song. And like the crowd, of course, when the PA came back on, was like, yeah. You know, and as the cops are leaving, they're like, yeah, fuck you, motherfucker, yeah, get the fuck out, you know what I mean? And then everybody came flooding back in who was outside. It was a huge celebration from the audience's standpoint. HR never mentioned a fucking word about it. It was like, dude, oh my God. And I'm saying, I, I got to see them a number of times back in those days. And uh, like, 
you know, it, it was always it was always amazing. Like I've seen that guy do shit in Atlanta at the Metroplex. The Metroplex, um, the first location that I first mentioned, that was on Lucky Street. Then they moved a block over to Marietta Street. That location is the one most people know about, the Marietta Street. It was a big building. It was kind of a lofty building, and it had a balcony. So it had two floors and a balcony. One time the Bad Brains played there. They're, they're standing on stage about ready to start the show. Every, the Dr. No, Earl, and, uh, and Daryl, they're all like ready to go. There's no HR. Audience is kind of looking around, you know, because they can see they're really about to get going, you know. And like, where's HR? Where's HR? They start their intro, man. Dude, HR fucking drops out of the ceiling, man. He fucking lands, <laughs> on, beat, lands on beat. Fucking grabs the mic just in time. Starts in, in the first song, man. Dude, I mean, I'm telling you, man, he's so, like, I've seen him, that dude lean out over the crowd, like with the mic, holding the mic in his hand, man. There'll be like three grown men fucking pulling at his arm. Like they're hanging on his arm like it's a fucking jungle gym. His arm's not moving. His arm is still here with the mic, ah, you know? That's how strong that motherfucker was, man. He's the, I can't even, he's just the best. He's the best. That band was the best. He was the best. It just, there's nothing to touch them. As far as, again, bands I've seen in person in the room where I saw, I, there was times I was seeing shit and I was like, I can't believe I'm witnessing this shit. You know what I mean? Like, that's how great they were. And yeah, but I mean, to get back to the thing, like, yeah, we were inspired. ABOC, my first band was inspired by them because, well, they were from Washington, D.C. like me. They were black like me and they were fucking the best. Yeah. So it was like, okay. Once again, like with Hendrix, we're kind of starting at the top, you know, like it doesn't get any better than this. We're just going to try our best, you know. So I kind of I was kind of singing like like Dez Kadena from Black Flag on the hardcore songs. But then I would try to really sing, sing on our reggae songs. And it was a mixture. But then I have quickly realized that I didn't want to be a singer. <laughs> Strangely <laughs> enough, how things have turned out. But I didn't want to do it. And. So I was like, I just want to play guitar and write the songs, you know, and I'll find some crazy ass motherfucker to be the front man. Like, you know, so I, when, when Neon Christ was starting, I, you know, was kind of always on the lookout for like, who in the scene do I think could maybe do this, you know? And I found this guy, Randy Duto, who had just moved down from Minneapolis. And, and where I discovered him was he came to see AVOC play one time at the original Metroplex location on Lucky Street. And that location, they had a very like small, low to the ground stage. It was just high enough to like put your, you know, put your foot up on the stage, like if you're in the audience and really get into what the band is doing, you know? Yeah. Just enough height where you could really do that comfortably and then maybe spring off into like a, you know, a, sort of a semi stage dive. And Randy, one time we were playing and he had his foot up on the stage and he was just screaming along to the words but he could only figure out like one word to the song, you know, for sure <laughs> that he knew. So he just kept screaming that over and over again. But with everything he had, I was like, oh, that motherfucker right there. <laughs> That's the guy, you know, like, so we got him in the group, you know, and he quit college to join Young Christ. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Fucking pissed his parents off something fierce, but he, he did it. And, and that was, that was it was cool too because like I feel like that four piece version of the band, I mean we it, to get where we got in terms of like what we wanted to do live and everything like that, you needed somebody to spearhead the thing. You know what I'm saying? Like to be somebody just holding a mic who could who could really interact with the audience and who was you know just outgoing in that way that i was not then i was really really introverted then and i i turned everything inward the writing was you know everything about the way i play guitar was i'm working some shit out <laughs> you know right. what i mean <laughs> like i don't have time to be all fucking sociable and ask y'all motherfuckers how you're doing i don't give a shit you know what i mean all i want to see is I want to see y'all working shit out the same way I'm doing up here. I want to see everybody fucking going nuts the way I feel all the time and the way I want to play, you know? So, but Randy was the guy who could interact. He was a great conduit, you know? So it was perfect. 
And I think that's a big reason why, I mean, between the songs and between the live show, which he was such a big part of, I think that's the reason why that group was able to catch on the way it, the way it did. <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm so fucking pumped now. I hope that you guys record these songs. Really it would be nice. It'd be, it'd be really nice, man. You know, it was funny because just before you called, I was, I was texting back and forth with Jimmy Deemer about that very subject. We were just doing it like a f- few minutes before, you, before I talked to you. I mean, so it's, it's become a subject that's been picked up just today. You know, right. so it's interesting timing. Yeah. <clears throat> Amazing. Yeah. So when, when, did you, when did you jump back to the microphone? Well, that was... Because it's worked um, little, out pretty well for you. Yeah, yeah, it did okay, I guess. Yeah, and um, it, it was, it was. I, I formed a group called No Walls after um, after Blast. I did a thing called the Final Offering with Mike Dean from COC and Greg Somas, who was the Keith Moon of Atlanta, the guy who I looked up to from Atlanta. I got him to join our band with Mike Dean and me. I left Blast. Mike Dean left COC, and we. This was COC was touring out in Northern California. They were playing in Berkeley, and Mike. Uh, he was like, man, after we're done with this, like with, with this run, like these shows out here, I'm quitting, I'm leaving. And so I was like, well, man, I'm quitting blast. You know what I'm saying? So like we made a, we made a pact and we're going to go back East. We're going to start something. And I was like, I know who I want to play drums in our thing. You know, Greg Somas, that's the guy, man. And he knew, you know, he knew of Greg a little bit too. Cause you know, DDT didn't do as much work as neon Christ did, but everybody knew Greg Keith Moon of Atlanta. Okay. So that was a no brainer. And we, we did exactly that, man. Like Mike, he went back to Raleigh for a little, little bit to like get some things straight there. And then he moved down to Atlanta and I walked into <laughs> Greg Somers was working at, at a restaurant. I walked in, he was like taking the garbage out, man. I fucking walked right. Up. I was like, dude, you've got to be in my band. You've got to be in my band. And he's like, dumping the trash <laughs> just like <laughs> oh, okay man like where are you guys rehearsing you know what i mean but we made it happen at least for a while greg developed a pretty serious fucking heroin habit and uh and he died uh back in 93 but but back in 87 uh, you know he he still had the last remnants of the greg i knew you know yeah. and uh it was just too bad though because we couldn't tour because man like Mike and I would book a bunch of shows and then Greg would appear. And we have to call the promoters back and just be like, man, I'm sorry, man. You know, and there were some good shows too. Like we had some really, I mean, tours with like Scratch Acid and, you know, bands like that that, you know, were were doing like cool stuff the way we were doing cool stuff. It wasn't hardcore, it was kind of post hardcore. But anyway, I called it the final offering because I knew. Whether it worked or not, it was going to be the last thing that I did that was going to be like that, where it was that punk influence, because I wanted to get into other things. And once I started getting into those other things, that was when I had to deal with the microphone again. Because when I started this group, No Walls, in 88, that was kind of, um, it was rock, it was jazz, it was, it, was, it was like if you took Sonic Youth and Joni Mitchell and, and like Hendrix and Miles Davis and Ornette, and threw them all in a fucking Cuisinart. You know what I'm saying? That's what it was like. And so we could play, it was a trio, but I, but on bass, I had a guy who rivaled Jaco Pastorius and Charles Mingus, you know what I mean? And on yeah. drums, I had a fucking white Elvin Jones. He was a long red haired Elvin Jones. And he was, I mean, I just, I couldn't believe my fortune in finding those guys because that was exactly what I wanted in Atlanta in 1988. Couldn't believe it. I and mean, it's not like I was in New York. You know, if I was in New York, those guys would have been falling off fucking trees, you know, whatever, they had trees there. But like, <laughs> you know, here in Atlanta, at that time especially, it was unheard of. And I managed to find these guys both going to Georgia Tech and we did it up. And and the music we ended up doing was kind of, it would, the closest thing that could be described probably is like what Jeff Buckley ended up doing some years later. like. And because it was world music meets rock, but it had this kind of grander thing and it was ambitious and and it incorporated a lot of jazz. We played even the songy songs that we played, we played them never the same way twice. So there was a lot of improvisation even within our most, you know, basic songs, you know what I mean? Like, 
And uh, is there recordings of that? Can I find a recording of this? You can. It's hard to find, but you can. I mean, because because we were trying to. That was a period where I was really interested in interfacing with the commercial music scene, because you know I was tired of like doing. Oh, it's underground. You know, you, you sleep on people's floors and you don't get. You know, nobody knows. And I, yeah, I'd done it. You know what I mean? Now it was like, no, this is really ambitious and this is really great. And I feel like this is this is picking up where all of my idols left off. And this is the what to me sounds like the next logical step in the continuum right and so you know i really wanted to put this out in a real way and so it was it was really fortunate fortunate uh fortunate because uh right around that time uh i met vernon reed living color this is like 88 89 they were the biggest thing one of the biggest things going of that year so badass they're opening for the Stones and they're doing all this, you know, they're on TV every second on MTV when MTV was MTV and they had a hot record, you know, and Vernon was the guy to take that to because Vernon had so much of, uh, uh, he had so much credibility in history in both rock and jazz and world music. And I mean, if there was one guy on the planet that you'd want to hand your demo tape to, if you were me in 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 you know in 1988, it would be Vernon Reed, and I and I I managed to get him a tape, and uh, he freaked out on it, and he called me up, and we we've been friends ever since, but he really tried everything to use his political capital that he had at that time to get No Wall signed, and um, and. He would, you know, he brought us to New York several times. He did everything that he could do. I'm sorry, I have a dinner reservation and I've got to start. I realized what time it was. My wife is calling me. <laughs> She's like, we have to go. Okay. So, yeah, I just realized what time it was, babe. Um, but, like, he he tried everything, man. He would, we'd, we'd go up to New York. He'd have us playing every club you could play. You know, CB's, the, the, the Cat Club. Kenny's Castaways, you know, we did a, we did the village, you know, we did a tour of Greenwich Village. We played, yeah. we played Ron Wood's place. Remember, he had a place there called Woody's. We yeah. played there, like we did everything. Every time the industry would come down, they'd be like, "What the hell is this?" You know, what I mean, you had you had the same guys who were working the Warrant record or the MC Hammer record right. coming down to see No Walls. It was like, "Hell no," you know what I mean? <laughs> and a biracial trio playing this fucking weird hybrid of rock and world music and avant garde jazz and they were just like yeah no i don't think so and uh you know i mean even buckley you know he he even he presented a challenge to some of those folks so you can imagine what we represented to them years before it was like this is a hell no like this was even before this was even before the seattle explosion you know we're right. talking like 1990 we're we're doing this stuff so they didn't even have nirvana to say hey you know something different can kind of be successful Right. You know, we didn't even have that to work with. So no, it's like, no, uh, trickster is getting all the money right now. So fuck off. <laughs> right. You know, and, and so, yeah, it didn't happen. But, you know, Vernon and I, we, we've stayed friends. But the, but I say that to say that that was the band that made me get back on the mic because I had to really I was writing stuff that I could never imagine handing to someone else to try to do. Right. And. So I had to do it. And actually, our bass player in No Walls, Henry Shroy, he was the guy that said, you know, well, man, why don't you just do it? And we used to tape all of our rehearsals then, you know, on cassettes. We had like we had mics around the room. So we pick up the room sound and they would go into a cassette deck. We recorded everything, all our jams and everything. But, but when I started bringing in songs, he was like, well, you know, man, why don't we try this? You know, and and I sang it and he was like, we listened back. He's like, man that's really good, you know? And he was not one to give it up for, you know, I mean, he, he was not, you know, he was not one for that, where he's just going to say some stuff to make you feel good. He, he, he's not going to say anything he doesn't mean, especially when it comes to music. Right. And uh, so he, when he said, man, that, that's, that's good, you know? I was like, okay. So we, we uh oh, you're freezing up. You know, out of necessity. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, we got bad weather. Am I you good? Yeah, yeah. But that's what now. started that whole thing out of necessity. Did you ever yeah. do anything? Did you ever do any recording with Vernon? Did you ever work with him in any capacity? Yeah, I actually did. I uh, Vernon and I. He did a solo record back in '99, and I went to his house, 
and uh, right there on the spot, wrote about three songs in his kitchen. And one of them uh, is a song called Fearless Misery. And so Vernon had this track, and uh, I wrote the lyrics right there on the spot, sang it, and it ended up on these, this uh, Lawrence Fishburne movie. The, the, first fish, the first movie that Fishburne directed is a song called, it was a movie called Once in the Life. Uh-huh. And uh, so his directorial debut. And he stars in it, and he wrote it and directed it. It's a good movie. And go anyway, Fishburne. Yeah, Fishburne, he used that song in the movie, but the song also was on Vernon's solo record. And uh, yeah, Fearless Misery. It's a cool, cool tune. Oh, I got to go check uh, that out. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's pre Alice. When did the Alice thing come out? Oh, around? yeah. Alice, well, Alice came about because of uh, because of my group comes with the fall. Which we? oh yeah, we're still out here. So comes with the fall started in uh, 1999, right around right after right around the time or right after the time I did the Vernon solo record uh, collab. Um, I wanted to get into like uh, the kind of rock music that I wanted to hear. You know sure. what I mean? Like I wanted to rock, but I wanted to do it my way, and uh, I wanted it to be a thing where it was the culmination of all of my experience up to that point. You know what I mean? Yeah. But still, really focused. So that became comes with the fall, and and, and uh, comes with the fall. Oh, are we, are we not good? Well, we're 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 getting choppy. It's going to connect. It's going to connect. Oh, here we are. It's going to connect. <laughs> yeah, it's going to connect. It just needed a second to connect to the Bluetooth. Comes with the Fall recorded our first record in Atlanta in 1999. And then uh, I put that record out on, on my label. And uh, we, we immediately, immediately took it finished. To and moved to LA. So when we moved to LA, one of the first people we met was Cantrell. Because a mutual, a mutual friend turned. Uh, hey, William. We got a really <laughs> dicey connection, man. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we could, maybe we could pick up and ah, oh, shit. Oh, there you are. It's the weather now. Yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe, yeah, it's the weather, dude. Maybe sorry. we could. Oh, but, no, um, it's okay. But, maybe we could pick up and do another yeah, 30 okay. or something. I can tag it on the end uh, later on. Like, even maybe not tonight, maybe uh, tomorrow or something. Yeah, that's possible. Okay. I'm going to text you, Jackson. Um, yeah, no, that, that could be possible. Um, I don't want to uh, I don't want to impose that, on your guys' on your guys' time. No, I, mean, I just got. I've just got to get to this restaurant. But well, uh, let's go as far as we can now, because I just don't know. My my week is fucking okay. insane. Okay. Um, but uh, but when uh, when it comes with the fall move to L.A., <clears throat> Cantrell was one of the first people we met because the mutual friend turned him on to us. She like made him listen to the record. She was like, "You must." <laughs> you <know? laughs> it was like he finally did, and once he did, he was like. He told me later, it was like he only had that experience a couple times where the first time or a couple times he heard something, he wasn't sure. And then one time he was forced to really listen to it. And then it became like, oh, shit, it was with Appetite for Destruction and us, the first comes of the yeah. whole album. <laughs> and so after that, he was like, I got to meet that guy. And so we met at a club called The Dragonfly. We were introduced and it just it just kind of became a thing after that. We were we were hanging out most every day. He was finishing up the Degradation Trip album back then. This is like 2000, you know, and uh, <clears throat> so, and we were just playing every gig that we could play in Hollywood, and uh, making every scene that we could make. Not so much to be discovered. I'd kind of given up on the commercial music industry by then, but just to make a mark, you know. Like at that point, I was just kind of doing it because it's like we exist, and I'm gonna make as much noise as I can no matter what, like if the ship sinks, I'm going to go down with it. And, uh, you know, and I'm going to go down my way, you know? So 
we were playing all over Hollywood, man. And, and, and he was at our apartment all the time. And so he like would learn songs off our first album. He learned like two of the songs off of our first album. And then he started coming on stage with us every time we played. So people thought he was joining our band for a while, you know, and then he moved into our building. So we were just around each other. He all sounds the time. like a and, fucking stalker, man. No, and it was, you know, that's the thing. It was like, yeah. We were we were it, we were that tight, and maybe maybe he missed a little bit of the band camaraderie thing because we yeah. were very comes to the fall at that point it was all for one you know kind of thing. We were we were all living together like you know it kind of probably reminded him of early days of of Alice and things like that when those guys were living you know in each other's pockets all the time you know, and uh, but and also the music was dope. So I mean you know that was the main thing. It was yeah. like this is where the energy is you know. So, uh, you know, we kind of were hanging out a lot every day, pretty much. And, and uh, he was finishing up that degradation record. And then in, by 2001, he wanted to go and play some shows, even though he, 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 was, he hadn't found anyone to put the album out yet. He hadn't made a deal for the record yet, but he just wanted to go play some shows playing that music, you know. And so he just like asked if we wanted to go out with him because, you know, we were like a ready made band. And so for two years straight, we went out opening the show as comes to the fall. And then we'd come back on stage, right, you know, towel off backstage, come back on stage with him and, and play that music, play the degradation trip music. And we'd also pepper the songs, you know, the set with Alice songs and, you know, play a few Boggy Depot things. And I was having to sing that stuff, you know. So, I remember 2000, uh, 2001 or 2002, I, I saw you guys at South by Southwest. Yeah, man, we played Stubbs. Yeah, I was Yeah, there. man, I remember that, that gig. Was great. That was a killer show, dude. I played Comes there the day before. Gig. No, it was Comes killer. Yeah. had a great gig, and, and Cantrell's uh, uh, had, a, had a great gig, Cantrell's group. We were, we were, we were on fire that night. And, uh, you know, I mean, that was what led to the whole thing, man, because... By you know, by the time you've rolled around for two years straight playing five nights a week, you know, all over America, because I mean, you know, we played the nooks and crannies of America. You know what I'm saying? We were like, yeah, we were, we were going into Fayetteville, Arkansas. You know, we were playing, we were doing a lot of the flyover stuff as well as the as the, you know, the big towns. And like, then we went to England and we did the same thing. You know, we didn't just play London or whatever. We played fucking Wolverhampton. You know what I mean? So yeah. we were like. We were really touring, touring, hard touring, four, four in a row, five in a row, that kind of shit. And like, you know, you get to know people, <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? That's the kind of thing that it'll either destroy you or it'll forge you into something like made of titanium, you know? So that was what happened. We got forged and um, that's what that's what paved the way for the whole deal, man. You know, um, fast forward a few years and, uh, you know. He was like, man, do you want to come down and, and uh, you know, I'm getting together with Kenny and, and Inez and, and, you know, I've told them all about you and all of this. And so that was what it was, man. You know, um, and we've been rolling ever since. <laughs> I saw, um, I think it was before you guys did a studio record. I saw uh, with Velvet Revolver at, on tour. Uh, in yeah, we did. You guys didn't have a, hadn't made the record yet, right? That was like two thousand eight or something. Maybe? Seven, seven, seven? two thousand seven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this was before then, mm -hmm. and uh, man, I just remember, I just remember being so stoked. Right on, man. I sat yeah, we... side stage, and you know, song after song was happy and like impressed with how everything came together, and just yeah, really happy that there was. Uh, that the band was just happening. Yeah, man. I mean, by then we had been around the world and, and, and we were actually writing what became the Black Is Way to Blue album then. And uh, we were not going to play any shows in 2007. We had already made a decision not to play anything in 2007 and just to concentrate on, on uh, getting the material together. And then Velvet Revolver extended this invitation and it was like, well, <laughs> you know, all right, you know, like we'll make an exception for this, you know, 
because it's Duff and Slash and, you know, yeah. and, and, and Wiley and Matt Swarm, you know. And so it was like, yeah, and it was cool. And I'm glad we did it. And uh, we were we were pretty on fire, you know, and, and uh, just, felt, bet- uh, just between us. I think th- I mean, I think Velvet Revolver is a great band. You guys. I mean, I'm usually not into this kind of thing, but it was just like it was. A, I mean, there was just there was so much weight to it. It was just like, oh, how are you going to follow this? And I, and I don't think that they I don't think that it, they fulfilled on that promise. I mean, it was like that's a, that's a band hard to follow, man. Yeah, the Alice in Chains of 2007 was uh, it was a pretty uh, it was a pretty rabid dog. I mean, you know, I mean, I've I've just speaking for myself. It was very much like, <laughs> you know, this is uh, this is going to be a no holes barred experience. You know, like I don't want to I'm prepared to leave a lot of blood on the floor here because you know by that point we had invested a lot of time into it and it became something more than what we had started out thinking we, we you know initially it was sort of hey you just want to go and play these few shows it's just kind of a celebration of the past and you know a little bit of a victory lap for those guys you know and uh you know and i was just kind of like yeah you know sure because my friend is asking me to do it, and uh, it's uh, guaranteed paying the rent for at least a year, you know? Yeah. And uh, but by the time you get into, like, you know, 35 or 36 countries that we've played, and, you know, we've done all of this, you've just hit the stage so many times, and it's been such a such a heavy experience from the standpoint of the audience is all, like, you got thousands of people looking at you like, yeah right motherfucker prove it you know what i'm saying and then you got to go do it and you got to go do it in every language and every time zone and every you know weather and every kind of no matter how you feel and um you've done that so many times by the time velvet revolver asked us to go out it was just like like i said we weren't expecting to play now we are going to play and now it's like these sheds in america and you know sheds are like always a challenge because it's usually seated all the way down the front, you know, and like, and so not only do you have, yeah, right, motherfucker, prove it, but you've got, yeah, right, motherfucker, prove it, and I'm going to act like I'm at home watching television while you do. I'm going to have my phone up to my face or whatever. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) So, yeah, so I was really like, yeah, I'm not having any of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, I really use that as a motivation to be uh, more rabid then i mean well you could tap you know, into like some it, of the uh some of the 15 year old you then couldn't you right well yes to bring and it all the way exactly back around what I've had to do that's exactly right that's exactly what i've had to do for all of the past 14 years is basically tap into a lot of that but with the experience that's happened since then you know so but yes it is full circle from from an energy standpoint, you know, and somewhat from somewhat from a uh, emotional standpoint, you know, it's been very interesting how full circle some of that's been. Definitely, the 2004 was was a lot of that, yeah, because we were still proving ourselves in America as far as as far as I was concerned, as far as we were concerned, and I, I think as far as the public was concerned. I think we're starting you know. to get a dicey connection again. I'm going to, you know what? Um, let's, let's turn off the video and I think we'll have oh, wow. uh, a better time with uh, just audio. Let's see what happens. I think it, I think we'll uh, probably not require as much juice. And so uh, it'll I work a bit better for us. I think it's, I think it's, Did I do it. Uh, I don't know, but it, still looks, see it looks good. No, you don't <laughs> see. Okay. Um, All right. Well, uh, I mean, I've seen the band. I saw the band back in the 90s, and I saw the band um, in 2007. And then I've seen them, fuck, probably 20 times since then in every country. I've seen seen you guys play in the UK and Canada. Uh, 
Germany, I think. I mean, we've done a lot of festivals together. I saw you guys in South America, and it's just, uh, it's incredible. And um, depending on what day you ask me, I'd say it's better than ever. Um, right on, man. So, yeah. right uh, on. I feel like it's important. It's important for me to uh, express that to you, and I think it's important for people to to consider that that's that's at least possible. Like, yeah, you know, right. You know, uh, in a lot of ways, it's better than no, ever. Man, it's, well, it's hugely appreciated here. Thank you, man. Really. Um, you know, I'm was super stoked about the solo record, and. Uh, I sure hope that you guys get um, get the Neon Christ stuff recorded, and I'm gonna yeah. go. I'm gonna go try and find this uh, the No Wall stuff and go listen to the uh, the Vernon record. Vernon is a guy yeah. I've been trying to track down for a while. Um, oh yeah. We have a bunch of mutual friends, and I want to try and get oh. him in one of these videos. Like, uh, uh, I have some. I have some uh, some interesting ideas. I mean, he's just like. He was, he blew me away when I, when I saw that band, you know, I just, yeah, man, he's, he does it like nobody else. He's super cool. And, uh, you know, we have, we have had many, uh, many, a long, long discussion, you know, like about many, many things, sure. <laughs> you know, life, the universe. He's just, he's a, he's a, he's a great thinker, you know? And I've always appreciated the way his mind works. And uh, I just, you know, I love him as a human being, man. You know, and, and as a musician. Um, you know, again, he's, I've been, I've been uh, fortunate to uh, have these people come into my life that, uh, that, that bring so much to the table just in their own right, man. You know, like, like, regardless of whether I get exposed to them as, or not, they're just making the world a better place, you know? And yeah. then when I get to meet them, it's like they enrich my life in, in, in indescribable ways, you know? And it's like, Vernon's one of those people, man. Like he's, uh, you know, he's a dude that, uh, especially when I was a younger guy, man, he was somebody like when I was in my early twenties, man, you know, he's got, he's got, enough he's got a he's got about 10 years on me too it's it was a similar situation to what i had with my cousin when i was a really little kid you know it was like oh this guy's somebody i can look up to for real for real you know like right just on a life level this is a guy that man he knows a lot you know like <laughs> i can really <laughs> you know he, he's somebody i can i can model after and i can you know set goals and all that kind of stuff yeah he's but he's still he's still just amazing. He and I he and I spoke last like uh, not too long ago when this uh, when this whole when this whole pandemic thing really uh, kicked in like when the lockdown really kicked in. He called me up, man, and uh, you know I think it was just one of those things, man. Like a lot of a lot of people when they are uh, especially when we're really busy, people like 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 us who are really busy all the time and going, 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 going. And then you're forced to stop and you're just sitting there contemplating a lot of things that you don't normally have time to contemplate. And you start thinking about the people in your life that mean something to you. Um, I think there were a lot of calls like this happening all over the world. And I, I feel privileged to have been one of his calls like that. Cause he just called me up and it was just like, man, I just wanted to see how you were doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, oh, this man. year has been a heavy one for, you know, everyone. And yeah. it feels like it just isn't letting up. And, yeah. so, and some, with, then there's some great things that are happening. And and then there's just a lot of, you know, I, I don't want to politicize things, but they, like, you know, the... There's a lot of there's a lot of division happening, and I just I hope that absolutely the year has been like it's just been a a wet fart of a year to be honest. It's just been a terrible fucking thing, and um, definitely a tough one. Yeah, but thankfully it it comes at a time this time around when 
you know, people can communicate more right. easily than ever. For yes. better or worse, actually. You know? Yes. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah. And I mean, you know, I, uh, I'd i like to think mostly for the better, only because, you know, um, I, 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 I want to uh, try to remain optimistic. And, uh, and I, and I want to say that the, uh, the increased facility of communication overall could be a good thing just because there are a lot of vital conversations that need to happen and, you know, having more tools to, uh, to have those conversations is probably on on balance all things considered probably a good thing you know um uh you know i mean but yeah the world's gonna keep spinning no matter what you know <laughs> hopefully hopefully uh those of us on it will get it together <laughs> yeah no kidding. you know uh do you guys live right in in the city or are you guys on the out outskirts of town we are, we are uh, kind of out of the city, but I think just close enough to be to feel that we have a little distance in a good way, but yeah. close enough to where it's not a complete ordeal to get a lot of the places that we would want to get when we do go into the city. Sure. Um, so it's kind of a good balance. Um, yeah, we're What's not right in the city, thank goodness, because I. I wouldn't want to be right now. What's the know? vibe been in in Georgia? It has been, uh, I think, it's been challenging, man, because like, uh, like you said, there there's all this division, and I think uh, a lot of that has has, I think Atlanta, as a city, and Georgia as a state, uh, has been one of the towns on the cutting edge of playing out all of these contradictions, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's been, yeah, it's been a little bit of almost like a, a, a test case for right. how some of these things can play out, whether it's for better or for worse. Um, you know, and Atlanta is interesting because, uh, you basically have the city of Atlanta and then you have the state of Georgia, you know, and yeah. those things often run diametrically opposed to one another, uh, you know, in terms of things like, you know, maybe politics or or, uh, you know, certain social issues or whatever, you know. And so um, we've been right there at the crux of a lot of these disagreements uh, about all of these things. And uh, so it's been a trip, man. Definitely been a trip, you know, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm in, you know, I'm in New York, so we got the same thing going on. The city and the and the state, yeah, yeah, um, are often at odds. And you know, this year's been no exception whatsoever. Yeah, right, right. I think it's, I think it has only intensified a lot of disagreements that have uh, been, you know, festering for a long time, you know. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's definitely been, it's been a trip, man. And I, it's going to continue to be, you know, definitely going to continue to be. Well, um, yeah, I hope you, I hope you make the, the best of, of the time, you know? Yeah. I definitely yeah, have. Thank you. I definitely, this has been right oddly, the most productive year of my life, actually. Oh, well, that's cool, man. Which is you insane. Know? That's really cool. And I think it's I think it's important to to also just, you know, there's there's productive from like a professional standpoint. And then there's there's also is it Peachtree or am I trying to get on the Peachtree highway? Street Northeast. So I'm going Peachtree, not not the highway. OK. Yeah. Okay. yeah you know what? That makes sense because, yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, it, there's also there's also productive on a personal level. Right. With of your course. family, your friends, you know, with yourself, you know, and and and. Uh, regardless of what's going on professionally and uh and you know financially right and i don't want to minimize any of that 
you know, because I know it's been really rough, man, for a lot of people. And uh, and it's definitely, you know, and I'm it has not. I've not gone unscathed from the challenges of that either. Like I said, I lost I lost a, a six week European tour that I was kind of you know I I built a lot of my year around you know uh, in terms of not just those six weeks but I mean like the momentum that it was going to create for the rest of the year. Um, so you know I do feel that as well, not as acutely as some, and I would not pretend to compare myself to to those situations. But I just mean to say that. Regardless of all of that, there's there there is productive on a personal level, and uh, and I think you know that 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 all of us there is at least an opportunity to uh, to uh, perhaps improve or at least appreciate you know some of the relationships that we have you know whether Absolutely. they be familial friends uh, or and like I said just with ourselves even, you know? Um, so there is that. And if, and, and if you're, and if you are fortunate enough to be able to avail yourself, avail yourself of any of those opportunities, it's a good thing. You know, that is a good thing. <clears throat> and I have been, so I'm very thankful for that. Right on, man. Right on. Listen, uh, I really appreciate you, um, putting aside so much time and taking me yeah, on a drive there. across yeah the right <laughs> um is uh I, super cool to learn about uh your whole history and i appreciate oh, thanks, you man. uh opening up uh to talk thanks, about it man. so thanks man yeah dude right on right um, on i'm i'm hoping that the video that we did is going to go up in the next two weeks Cool. I'm waiting for the song to come back uh, mixed. I don't know if you saw the first one that I that I finally got finished. I'm working on a half dozen of them right now. Um, oh! But if you haven't seen it, um, you should watch it. I I put a few people together, including Trey uh, Gunn from. Oh, cool! Yeah, man, Trey Gunn put a guitar solo on the end of uh, oh, nice. of a song that did didn't have a guitar solo, but. It seemed, <laughs> right seemed perfect but it's a uh, criminal by um fiona apple and it came out oh cool it came out really really well so right on. i think um yeah go give it a listen man go see it it's on the, it's on instagram and youtube i'll send you a link um please do but uh i think ours is the one that we did i, I won't name check it here because i don't want people to i want that to be a surprise at least okay um fair enough it's gonna be really really killer it came out awesome really, dude. really good yeah so you yeah, crushed man. it thank you so much um thank yeah. you man yeah, thanks for having me on there yeah yeah that was fun that was a, that was a cool thing to do and and you know yeah I, it, and the kind of thing that i i wouldn't have done otherwise so it's really great you know it was like oh you know a chance to <laughs> challenge myself well yeah that's not as i mean that's a deceptively difficult song too it's like very oh, that's much a so. tricky one but yeah you very crushed it so. so thank you thank you man thank you amazing all right well listen thank uh you. have a great night thank you so cool, much brother. and yeah, um, man. we'll talk soon right on dude thanks man be good see you later you too bye <laughs>